So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to begin by actually saying a few words of introduction, not about our upcoming keynote speaker, but actually about our upcoming chairperson, a member of the board of the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy, a longtime friend and partner, Professor Dr. Ulrich Bruckner. Professor Bruckner is the Jean Monnet Chair Professor for European Studies at Stanford University, and in his free time, so to speak, he is also uh, serving as part of the leadership uh, of the Institute, and also helping us in particular with the Academy for Cultural Diplomacy, as most of you know, where we offer the only BA, MA, PhD program programs in the world in the field of cultural diplomacy. And Professor Bruckner has been very helpful for us uh, in the creation, not only of the more academic components, but also in terms of the theoretical and research components. So Professor Bruckner, thank you again so much for coming here today and uh, helping us to uh, chair the session. I will now give the microphone to you, and perhaps you could even say a few words of introduction on the, on the main podium uh, for our upcoming keynote speaker. So a, a brief warm of applause, first of all, for Professor Dr. Ulrich Bruckner. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As Mark kindly introduced me, I don't have to say anything about me in person. Is the microphone working? Can you yes. hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, as Mark said, I'm a Jean Monnet Professor for European Studies, and I came today with an international group from the Freie Universität, International Summer University. But I'm also here to work with students of cultural diplomacy, which if we would quote Karl Marx, which we don't do that often here, is not only enough to explain the world, but to change it. That's why in the other capacity of the ICD, when we do not only work academic studies and try to see how international relations work, or in this particular format of the conference, the dialogue with the Arab world work, it's important to also develop strategies and to discuss policy proposals. On that background, it's my great pleasure and honor to welcome Dr. Philipp Lengsfeld, who is a member of parliament since 2013. And he's born in the GDR and already as a pupil in school confronted with the conditions of what it means to live in an autocratic regime, which I probably think left already a deep impression at that time what it means to be a political person. And after studying natural science, he's a trained medical physician, he joined the Bundestag in 2013 and since then works in a number of capacities. So please join me for a warm welcome for Dr. Philipp Lengsfeld. So hello everybody, and my nicely arranged presentation has been <laughs> touched, but uh, not completely uh, disassembled. So, you already heard my name, uh, Philipp Lengsfeld, member of the German Bundestag. Um, I have given myself the title of cultural and political challenges in uh, Germany in the wake of the migration crisis. That's a huge title, so I actually brought it down to a few thoughts, um, and I, I think they will stimulate uh, some discussion. It's, uh, the first thing is about the whole uh, current situation in Germany, like in a, in, a, uh, in a focus lens, and the other things are challenges we have with integration and, um, and the Muslim communities. So uh, I, I guess all of this will be of quite some interest to you. You heard most of these. Um, so I start with a disclaimer and compliance statement. I'm from the conservative part, part of the Bundestag, uh, CDU, CSU. Um, we actually won the election, as you, as you know. Um, Chancellor Merkel is, is from my fraction. I was newly elected in 2013, um, but I've been very active in, uh, in local politics uh, for some time before that. My constituency is actually here, the center of Berlin. And before that, I worked 10 years in the pharmaceutical industry, and I am holding a PhD in physics. Um, but I worked very much in, in medical physics uh, during my time in industry. And this is an invited, uh, reimbursed talk, just for transparencies. And views expressed are my own personal political analysis. OK, let's start off with um, these challenges. And one of the challenges um, I thought is quite interesting for you under the topic of cultural diplomacy is how do we actually call the, 
the people, the persons coming in the current crisis to Germany? And that may sound like a very trivial question, but it is absolutely not. So basically the German society and uh, the mainstream media are currently calling almost everybody Flüchtlinge, refugees. Um, but if you look a little bit at the background of, um, of the current situation in Germany, you will see and understand that our migration is actually mainly driven by our very liberal asylum laws and the way we currently interpret them. And uh, before the current situation or crisis, we actually had a very similar situation in the 90s where um, the influx of uh, people seeking asylum uh, in Germany uh, steadily uh, increased to, to very high numbers. And at that time, the whole debate um, was around Asylbewerber, um, Asylsuchende, so asylum um, seekers, asylum uh, Bewerber is, is actually a, a, a apply for asylum, um, or if you put it more negatively, uh, Asylanten. And um, it was actually the same situation, but years later, we are now not talking about asylum anymore, we're calling them refugees, Flüchtlinge, or if you are very politically correct, you say Geflüchtete, um, because uh, some people said that even Flüchtlinge uh, sounds too negative. It's actually a very, uh, very positively connotated uh, word uh, in German because it really de describes people in need of, uh, of, of help, um, fleeing from, from terror, fleeing from maybe hunger or uh, some other situation. However, and that is, that is a problem, and I put those numbers right down here, um, even under the most liberal interpretation of our asylum laws, only about 50% of the people coming actually get the status of, um, of a refugee or of somebody uh, granted asylum in this country, which means that the other half doesn't get it. Um, now I think the numbers are a little bit changing. The 50% is maybe from the height of, of, uh, of the situation, um, uh, end of summer last year. Maybe the numbers are now a little bit better, although I'm not 100% sure. But still, you have a sizable portion of the people actually arriving in this country who are never ever uh, were granted um, the status uh, of refugee and probably uh, aren't refugees at all. And that is, of course, a huge problem. And I uh, show you this uh, slide because this is actually um, a photo of a current law we have just passed in the German Bundestag, um, Law of Integration, Integration uh, Integrationsgesetz. And uh, the German laws are always uh, uh, this nicely uh, prepared with stating A, problem and uh, target, pro problem and aim, and then solution and so forth, alternatives. And under A, you find this, uh, this sentence, uh, this was actually passed into law in, in the German Bundestag. Of, uh, and I translate that for you, Flüchtlinge ohne Perspektive auf Anerkennung als Flüchtlinge, which means refugees without the perspective of being granted the status of being a refugee, which is of course crazy. I mean, uh, at least I think it, it is crazy, although I uh, also voted for, for that bill, but uh, in that case I can say I'm being only one of, uh, of the 580 uh, uh, who supported, uh, who, who actually uh, um, drafted that bill, uh, I can, uh, I have only a very small uh, burden uh, to, to, sh to share. But this is the essence of the current problem. We are having people which we are calling refugees because they passed over the Balkan or the Italian uh, uh, Mediterranean route into Germany, but they are not refugees and they are not being granted the status of, uh, uh, of, uh, of being uh, accepted asylum seekers and uh, that creates, of course, uh, a lot of problems. We have to repatriate them. Uh, this is a very complicated process, politically very charged, uh, often impossible, technically impossible, uh, with several countries simply refuse to take back the, the people. Um, some have uh, destroyed their passport. They, they, they have, you have problems identifying them. 
Um, you have lots of activists, uh, lawyers and others supporting people to, to stay in the country, to, to uh, obstruct uh, the, the abschiebung. And you have several conflicts within the migration uh, uh, groups because they are the status A people, the true refugees, and there are others who know that they never have any uh, prospect of actually getting a legal uh, position in, in, in Germany. And this creates tensions um, within, for instance, these large uh, uh, shelter uh, communities, especially in Berlin. We have places where there are 1,000, 2,000 uh, uh, people uh, living together. And then you have, like the Syrians versus others, you have Muslims versus Christians and so forth. So this, uh, this creates uh, a lot of uh, challenges. So this is like the appetizer, although I, I realize I already took uh, some time uh, dwelling on this problem, but I think it's a, it's an, it's a key problem. Um, moving on now to problems of integration, viewed view through, through the, to the question of cultural diplomacy. Because this is really now straight out, out of the discussion in Germany, in my constituency in Berlin, uh, but also, also uh, um, in, in the whole country, because obviously a large portion of the people now coming into the country are, have Muslim, uh, Muslim uh, background, and of course a, a large number of migrants which are already in the country, especially from Turkey, also the Kurds and others, they are also uh, having a, a Muslim uh, background. So uh, the next three things are about cultural challenges uh, Islam and the German society. And I start with this um, very charged topic of headscarf, for instance, for female teachers. So, some Bundesländer like Berlin, uh, the, the Bundesland where we are currently, uh, have uh, something which is called um, Neutralitätsgesetz, neutrality law, which prohibits actually headscarves or other religious symbols in public offices, schools, etc. But this is being uh, legally challenged as we speak, and a number of court decisions have actually ruled that um, uh, that, that this law uh, may not be uh, be in compliance with uh, with the German constitution. But this is an ongoing process. But to give you an idea of the uh, of the ongoing political discussions, and we are learning a lot about. Uh, 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 details of the Islamic uh, culture uh, as we go along. Uh, I didn't know all these various um, types of, uh, of headscarves before. So um, the first three, we have a discussion on whether that should be allowed for schools, police, justice, and public offices. And for the more radical version of the niqab and the burqa, we have a discussion in Germany of a total ban in public. And um, as I told you, I'm presenting my political analysis, my views on the topic here. So I could, although I have to say it's very controversial in my, my own party, I personally could accept uh, headscarves in, in offices and schools. However, I've heard the argument that this puts considerable pressure on liberal, young um, uh, Muslim uh, women who don't want to wear a headscarf in school or university. So they are getting under pressure from their family or from their friends or from whomever if um, there are female teachers with headscarves. So this is, of course, a very important, a very uh, uh, heavy uh, counter-argument. Uh, so one has to, has, to, has to discuss that. Niqab and Boka, I have a very clear opinion on this one. I think they have no place in an free, open society. That is my view, but this is also a strong view in my party. Legally, of course, it's a, it's a different topic. So uh, as we are a free country, it's rather uh, difficult to actually uh, implement uh, such a ban, but on a political society base for me, that is no question. Second topic on Islam and German society, I picked Ramadan and school. Uh, because uh, I, I have some personal, uh, I had some personal uh, stories out of my constituency and out of Berlin, uh, but I also recently uh, looked into that in more in depth because uh, Ramadan uh, was in 
uh, school time just a few uh, weeks ago. So I, I looked into the details of the current discussions. Because of course, um, priority in Germany and in Europe is that during school time, a pupil should learn. And the priority during school time is not religion. Now we have an official sort of official position on this from the Islam Rat. The situation in Germany is that we don't really have strong Muslim uh, um, structures, but we have some, and the Islam Rat uh, is one of them. And I put this um, this position paper uh, up for you. This is on Ramadan and pupils fasting during uh, during school time from the Islam Rat and. The key sentence for me is this one, that the Islam Rat says that the question of whether a pupil should fast or not is a decision between the individual child and Allah. Parents or school have no right to interfere. And they actually give no clear age limit. They say you have to be mature enough to fast. And as you all know, uh, a strict interpretation means no drink, no eating the whole day. And a school day in, in Berlin can be quite long from, from 9 to, to 4 in the afternoon. I think this is, a, this is a very problematic position of the Islam Rat because obviously the mission, I call it mission mandate or duty of schools, is the well being of the pupils and the best education every day. Uh, and not partially, but wholly. So um, my personal view, again, um, I think we should be very strict on the age question. In, uh, in Germany, you have a, a mature age for religion. I, I, can't, I don't have a better translation for it, which is 14. I think below 14, there should be no discussion about religion because the, 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 the children are just too young. So no fasting uh, below the age of 14. And also for those who are older than 14, so mature to, to take their own religious views, I think we should, uh, we should be uh, rather strict on, uh, on, on, on allowing them not to drink uh, or not to, uh, to have the adequate energy during a, um, a school day. So I would say drinking and, and uh, necessary energy intake should be mandatory, should be a given. And above 18, of course, everybody is free to do what, what he pleases, can leave school, can, can do what he, what, what he or she wants. Um, so fasting is okay, uh, cannot be prohibited, but should be compatible with, with your duties in school, um, which should still be priority number one, I think. Last question, also very heated debate in Germany, question of handshaking. It was a huge controversy. I'm not sure whether you've, uh, you've seen it in, in Switzerland. And in Germany, we had cases of pupils refusing to shake hands with their female teachers. And we had a case in Berlin, out of Pankow, actually. I lived there uh, quite a long time, so I know the school also a bit. It's a private school, actually a very uh, posh, uh, expensive school. There was a father imam uh, out, of, um, out of Iran coming with his son to a specially arranged meeting with a female teacher because the son had some troubles in school and uh, the, teach, uh, the, the imam doesn't speak German, but uh, the first thing he says, I will not shake, I, I cannot shake your hand because of religious reasons. Uh, the female teacher also being relatively uh, aggressive, I would say, cancels the meeting and there's a huge fallout. Uh, uh, there is a legal case going on. Uh, things went all over the papers. The, 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 the school actually um, uh, issued um, a statement saying that, uh, that, they, uh, that they apologize uh, if there have been misunderstandings, but the, uh, but the uh, father and the son left the school. So a huge fallout. Strong resonance of this case and similar cases in the German society and the German media. Now, again, my analysis, this is a huge topic because of Gleichberechtigung, equal rights. We are actually pushing women to take responsible positions, not only in school, not only in university, but also in the police force or in hospitals or, or wherever. I mean, we are ruled by, by a chancellor, by a female chancellor. So this is a huge topic. 
And um, for me, it is clear that the core task in schools, on the street, in hospitals, in parliament, wherever you have female, uh, uh, female, uh, female workers, um, should be the respective tasks, the respective roles, and not whether uh, you are uh, being treated or governed or teached or whatever taught by a man or a woman. And of course, handshake is, in, uh, is a very deep-rooted custom in Germany. So my personal view, again, is, uh, uh, is actually it's, it's more or less mandatory for me, uh, the handshake. Um, and if there's really, really a situation like very religious monks, imams, but only in special cases, I would say, that they can't shake hands with females, then they have to do it indiscriminately and don't shake any, any hands, be it male or female. You should not allow anybody, especially not parents or patients for that matter in hospitals, to say, I don't want to be treated uh, or I want to discriminate between a female and a male person, although I'm an... Uh, uh, I, I'm actually uh, in, uh, in life danger, or um, my house is burning, or uh, my son needs um, good ed education. So this is my view on the handshake issue. And with that, I thank you for your attention. And I think we still have some time for a few questions. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Lengsfeld. Um, most of us do not come from Germany, and the reason why people come to Germany either to conferences or to study in the format of an international summer university should also give the chance to hear what people in this country think. And I guess this is a very good example of getting to know a specific German mindset which in a country which is very much committed to freedom is the freedom of the other, is certainly not the only one and an exclusive one. I personally have already a few questions, but since I was invited to be the moderator, I don't want to go too far to start a discussion here. But I think in the morning, what we did in class, to think of reality as a socially constructed play with words, we can also learn a lot from a presentation like this, that the way we put the current situation as problematic, that the number of people or the status of people or whether a habit or a tradition or a culture clashes with a culture of a titular nation, turns some things in a way in the terminology of a problem no matter if we are used or not used to this when we compare it with something else. So if we would take people to a beer festival in my home region in Bavaria, and they would observe the local tradition and how people interact in a beer festival or the use of alcohol as an integral part of their culture, one could use the same external observer position and ask to what extent such a cultural habit clashes with the titular nation or whether it's healthy or something, as if we go to the zoo and observe the culture of others and see whether what they do clashes with what we think is the guiding culture. And I think from the perspective of this, we are right anyway, or we define what we stand for and everything else is a deviation from the norm. So it all boils down to the question of whether religious norms are superior over the legal system and to what kind of legal systems is a difficult approach for cultural diplomacy because that turns into something like a hardliner position. This is us and they are the other and the other have to adapt if they want to successfully integrate, which is the background of the story. But as I said, this is just my comment to get started. I'm sure there are a lot of questions from your perspective, both from the participants of the conference or our guests from FUBIS, the Freie Universität International Summer University. So who's brave enough to ask for the microphone for a question or a comment 
for Dr. Langsfeld. Yes, please. Can we uh, have a as always, phone? please uh, briefly introduce yourself too, so that we know where you're from. Thank you for the presentation. My name is Hassan Diab. I'm a former minister from Lebanon. Um, this conference is about cultural diplomacy uh, in the Arab region, about Arabs in Europe, and so on. Um, of course, uh, immigrants to uh, or refugees or whatever you want to call them into uh, the region, into uh, Lebanon, the region in the Middle East, as well as Europe, are not only Muslims. There are all sects, all uh, religions, and of course, the majority are Muslims. But I'm surprised that we are concentrating on small aspects, you know, of uh, Islam, the handshaking. These are very uh, minor uh, issues. Uh, and we're just talking now, you were talking as well, about the rights of women to be able to, you know, dress the way they want, to be able to live the way they want without infringing on any laws, of course. So I think uh, this goes beyond these, in my mind, very minor issues into uh, more major issues of integration, of ideologies, and the whole culture of Islam with uh, uh, you know, the German society and the European society in general. Uh, um, and uh, whether uh, a woman, uh, I mean, my wife doesn't wear a veil, but whether a woman wears a veil or not, to me, this is her right. Uh, like, uh, you know, other religions uh, similarly uh, do. Uh, but uh, I think uh, the major issues go beyond these, what to me I regard as minor, whether you handshake or not, or whether this is a personal freedom as far as I'm concerned. I think uh, it's a bit too much to put a law uh, against something like that, uh, although I, I'm for handshaking, I'm not against it. But I wouldn't force somebody to handshake if they don't want to. Uh, I, would have, I would have liked to have seen the, the more major issues being discussed of uh, integration and how cultural diplomacy affect uh, uh, the million and a half or so Syrians in, in Germany. Thank you. Shall we collect a few or do you want to respond directly? Uh, I, I can respond to it because it's a key issue. I've been invited and I presented what I regard as important. And I can tell you, I wouldn't have presented the three issues if I would re have regarded them as being very small issues. I think they, they are maybe not the greatest issues in the world. Okay, that may be the case. But I think they are quite important because we have to agree on a certain way how we deal with these problems. And uh, if, I, if I take the, the, the middle one, that the fasting during school time, I think this has tremendous implications actually on, on, on success in school, on the way uh, uh, you interact, um, uh, also on the way you respect uh, 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 your, uh, your respective culture. So I, I wouldn't take that too lightly um, uh, because everything which revolves around education, and I think education is also a, a key theme here uh, for this conference, uh, is, is of fundamental value. And so this brings me to the second thing, which is the headscarf in schools, for instance. It's a very heated di di discussion in Germany, I, I can tell you. It's, a, it's not a minor issue. And um, uh, I, I, I think I have presented some balanced views, but I can tell you that we have very strong views on both sides of the spectrum. One saying it has to be allowed, others saying this would be like the end, uh, how, how does Pegida call themselves uh, uh, the, 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 the end of, uh, of, of the Occident, or what is it? Uh, uh, Untergang des Abendlandes. Uh, so uh, uh, this is a very, uh, uh, it is a symbolic issue, yes, but it's symbolically charged, and that's why it is actually of key importance. And the handshake thing, I think, is, is touching on a very fundamental theme. And I, I have very strong views on that. Um, and that is, you have to respect, that is regardless of where you are from, that applies to Germans, German with Turkish origin, with Kurdish, with what have you, Lebanese, foreigners, all the rest of it. You have to respect our physicians, you have to respect our police force, and you have to respect our teachers, and that irrespectively uh, on which gender they are. And uh, this is a very fundamental question. And of course, you can say, oh, I only greet uh, by putting my hand on my heart. 
But if it's in fact actually uh, challenging the authority, uh, um, or if then somebody comes and says, no, I don't want to have a female doctor, I, even though I'm dying, I need to have a male doctor, that, uh, that is uh, really uh, bringing uh, this uh, thing to a very uh, to, to a question of life and death. So I would say um, these are not the biggest issues in the world, but they are important and they need to be um, thoroughly discussed and, and solutions need to be found because uh, this, this, these are political and legal and organizational challenges uh, in Germany and Europe as we speak. Gentlemen, the gray t-shirt is next. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Jesse. Thank you first uh, very much for your uh, sp speech. It was very, very interesting. Presentation is very interesting. Um, so some of the views um, that you expressed um, seem to kind of, at least for me, it seemed as though it was going uh, somewhat against the idea of Freiheit, right? So freedom, like freedom to wear what you want, freedom to have certain religious views, and freedom to follow through with them. So how do you kind of deal with this juxtaposition of the the German idea of Freiheit and, and these views. You can hand it back to the lady behind you. Hi, uh, my name's Naomi and I'm a master's student here at the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy. I also work with an organization called Singer that uh, creates a community where locals and newcomers can come together on an even playing field to meet and co-create projects. Um, so what I wanted to ask was, in your presentation you talked a lot about the changes that, or the, the challenges that would lead to changes that need to be made on behalf of the refugees. But do you think there's anything that German civil society needs to be doing and the German, German government as well? Thank you. And maybe we can take a third one from the gentleman in the back. Thank you. Um, thank you, Your Excellency, for a very interesting speech. My name is Faisal. I'm a journalist. I, uh, I'm from Dubai. Um, I think you touched on a very uh, sensitive topic and you are literally under the, the spotlight now. Um, I, I, just to follow up with my colleague Hassan, I think what he was trying to uh, say is those people who believe that you know, a woman shouldn't shake hand or a woman should be wearing a burqa represent perhaps, I, you know, I don't have any figures, but they don't represent the majority of, of Muslims, particularly in a city like Dubai where you know, I live at the moment. Uh, we don't even talk about these issues because they, they don't exist. So my question is, uh, how much is of a problem it is? I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you that these issues must be tackled because obviously, as you pointed out, they create some sort of an obstacle. But how much of an issue amongst the immigrants uh, here um, uh, do they uh, um, form? And the other question is, how much buy-in do you have from the uh, Muslim community? Uh, and I am in no way saying that that would be uh, an easy topic. Essentially, if there is a, a, an agreement amongst Muslims, you wouldn't be having to do this in, in government. The problem, I think, and I, and I speak as a Muslim, the problem is with, with, with Islam is, um, th there was a very famous book that came out a few years ago, is Who Speaks for Islam? There is nobody that actually speaks for Islam, uh, or uh, given, we cannot even agree if Ramadan you know, ends on this day or another day, one country see, seems to see the moon, the other country doesn't seem to see the moon at the same time, although it's the same moon. So I'm in no way saying there is no issue um, with kind of a modern approach uh, to Islam, but I think your task would be much easier if you have a buy-in of uh, some sort of uh, a Muslim community inside the country. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, and, uh, very important and, and fundamental uh, questions. I, I'm just thinking which uh, which order I should take. Um, of course, freedom and, and, and law and order, that is a constant discussion. I mean, how much freedom can you grant uh, how much do you loosen that that is in, would be another discussion not not the, not not the integration religion bit uh, on security we are we are discussing this uh, every day in germany now uh, it's a, a video uh, observation uh, um, police laws and so forth of course this is limiting uh, freedom to some degree but on the other hand if you don't have security uh, then what is your, your freedom worth? So uh, this is not the perfect answer to your question, but, uh, um, but I understand, uh, I, I, I totally agree that, uh, that th this is a challenge. And I pointed out that on the headscarf in schools, for instance, I 
I'm more on the liberal side, but I also understand the arguments uh, uh, put in front of me um, by, by the more restrictive view on this. And um, I think it's always good to, to look at your peers. So there's the French way and there's the British way. I think they are very different in their approaches. And I tend to look more um, uh, uh, on the British side. Um, I think the French are too strict in... in, 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 in um, in, in, in not allowing certain cultures, cultures to flourish and, and the way they have a sort of badly integrated uh, society. I, I'm not an expert in French uh, internal polis, uh, politics, but, but I think it's fairly obvious that they, had ra they, had, they didn't do a perfect job on integrating their, um, uh, their, their minorities. Um, so that, that is certainly not the example to, to follow. Um, but on the other hand, if you look at, at the British society, it is also not going, it, it's not, a, there, there are also issues there. So, um, so this is also not the perfect uh, blue pause uh, for German politics. So we have, we, we have to maybe find our own approaches uh, uh, to tackle this problem. And, and that leads me directly to the question of should a German society also change? Of course. I mean, uh, any democratic society should be in a constant uh, mode of, of, of changing and improving because that is the very nature of, of, uh, of a free uh, democratic society, uh, also driven by competition uh, to improve. Um, and and that, uh, that is also on a cultural level. And it's not only competition, it's also enriching lives. So I'm a strong... Um, uh, believer in, in, in this idea of diversity, and uh, I mean, this is Berlin. If you look uh, look at, at, at Berlin's success story, this is because we are such an an open and diverse uh, and interesting and 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 uh, 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 a lively city. And this means changes. Sometimes this is tiring. I, I have dis discussions also almost every day. Sometimes people would like to have things kept the way they have uh, seen it on the first day they arrived in the city. I'm a born Berliner, so I know that this city is changing every day, but um, a lot of people sometimes have this dream that things just stay the same way uh, than when they first saw it, because they liked it so much. Um, but, uh, but obviously this is not the solution. Things are changing and... Um, Diversity is good, but it also has also some downsides. If uh, if you have uh, poorly integrated, um, uh, segregated uh, communities, this can create a lot of issues, and uh, we've seen it in other places, but we also see it in Berlin. So yes, we have to change, and I think we are doing it. I think we are learning a lot about uh, about various nations. Uh, a lot of people never will not say never heard about before, but never knew uh, the details about. Um, so, uh, so this is um, this is going on. And uh, the third question was now. Uh, uh, gesellschaftliche Selbststeuerung, hmm? gesellschaftliche Selbststeuerung von muslimischen Gruppen. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the interaction with the Muslim community. Yes, I'm not a fan of uh, of uh, pauschalisierung of generalization because I know you you know it much better, and you just said it yourself that. Islam is very, very diverse. I mean, Christianity is also diverse, but we have much more uh, uh, stringency in the Catholic faith, as I can uh, say, uh, see that, uh, uh, compared uh, to the sit situation with Islam. So we have to differentiate. We have to look at the individual communities. And yes, I want to work more, um, more closely with them, but guess what? This is only just beginning. I think for some time, they... There was virtually no structure at all. Things are now improving a little bit, um, but we, we have to jointly go a much uh, longer uh, away before we have well-organized uh, um, individual uh, communities. I think the Islamists are doing currently uh, probably the best job of organizing themselves, and that's, that's something we, uh, we, we have to fight, of course. But... Um, a lot of the other communities are pretty badly organized, as I as I uh, as I see it. Um, so so this needs to improve, um, and maybe they should also mature into being independent of their original countries. You need the national uh, identity. That is obvious for me. 
but if you take the Turkish community, for instance, they are very much uh, influenced by the current Turkish government, and that is obviously also not not a not a good position. So we we have a strong discussion in uh, currently about uh, the changes in in, in, in Turkey. Uh, and the way uh, the, the Turkish uh, community uh, in Germany is influenced by uh, President Erdogan uh, in a certain direction, um, uh, with, which, which increases tensions within, um, within the Turkish communities, because we also have Kurds and, and uh, Aleviten and others, and, uh, and they uh, are openly hostile uh, to each other uh, currently in Germany. And, um, so this is uh, this is this is this is all this is a problematic situation. So uh, yes, uh, we should uh, work uh, closely with them. I I, I want to do that, um, but it's easier said than done because um, the, the structures are not very uh, stable and not very deep rooted. Um, that is at least my impression. I think we have time for a final round. There are two ladies in the back. Ingo wants to ask something and. Maybe we put all these together. Okay, ladies in the back, ladies first, okay. Hello, thank you very much for your presentation and I think it represents a really hot topics in the German society. And I think it's very uh, healthy to have such a discussions at this moment. Um, but what I'm afraid of uh, after seeing this presentation is jumping to conclusions, applying laws on a top down policies that doesn't represent democratic uh, uh, values of the country and uh, what what I might maybe suggest especially because I work a lot in the cultural conflict uh, the cultural nature of the Syrian conflict and trying to look at identities and try to see how culture can be interpreted uh, understood or misunderstood is is really to to, to open a dialogue is to really create a platform where Germans and newcomers can come and discuss because there's a lot of uh, misperceptions here, like the way they shake hand in Germany, it means respect while in the culture of some Muslims, uh, putting the hand on the heart, it represents also respect to the women. So the respect, the concept of respect is agreed by by the Germans and by the newcomers. It only has a different representation in the body language. And if I think if such a discussion, such an open discussion happens in a, a very nice platform, they might be ag agreeing and accepting the concept of shaking hands more, more, most probably more than a law that tells them you are forced to shake hands because after all, Germany is a country full of values, full of culture, and I think if we deal with it in this way rather than a club that has rules, if you follow the rules, then you are accepted. If you are very much looking like the German in the way you are acting, and I think this assimilation will happen later on because when people interact, they will find a lot of common ground to, to interact amongst, but if they have these barriers from the very beginning with very clear-cut rules, I think this would really uh, make this integration even um, uh, slower and, uh, and difficult. I mean, that was my... But you forgot you. to introduce yourself. Um, yes, uh, my name. Sorry, uh, my name is Yara Mualla. I'm a PhD student here uh, at, the, uh, into, uh, at the ICD in collaboration with West of Scotland, and I'm from Syria. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, I am Fifalina. I am a lawyer from Madagascar, and uh, what I just wanted to point out is the creation. It's just what I noticed because. Um, uh, yeah, it, it's my first week in, in Germany, and I noticed is that the migrants, um, I, w I could see migrants in, in the roads and so on, and I noticed a creation of a new culture, it is a culture of pagan. Um, what I, I would like to point out is that um, even if uh, Germany is helping migrants, they are given st stipends and so on, but what I noticed is that the, those people, they should not use their children to beg. Uh, this can provoke hatred uh, from the other people. And also, um, we should control this 
uh, everyone, even uh, migrants, should be productive too. Um, they should have will to be um, regularized, to have a regularized situation. So I don't know if maybe um, there is already a solution about this, but I think it's a very, very bad influence and it has been created. It, it has not, um, this kind of behavior is not innate. So um, that's it, thank you. Um, um, hi, my name is Rafi, I'm from Afghanistan. I don't have comments on what you have presented, but... You get closer to the microphone? Yeah. Just closer. Uh, I have only uh, some comments what he has said. Um, as an uh, Afghan, I'm not a refugee, of course. I have just came here to have this uh, conference. Um, we understand, like we all understand that it's your home and you are the one who decide what should be have done, what, sh what is allowed in your home and what is not allowed in your home. Um, most of people coming as a refugee to EU, it's not because uh, to have money and to have, but the, the, the main point is that there we know that uh, European Union people, they respect human rights more than any other country. So that's why we are coming, uh, like people are coming here. So it's up to your generosity if you are only providing him a food and a place to live, or you providing him a, a good platform to, to live and practice what he believes in. Yeah. I know you have limited time. Should we bring the microphone back to you, or you I have to tell us? I would love to include Ingo as a final question. Okay, final question. Very kind. Very kind of you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ingo Peters from Freie Universität Berlin and I'm also teaching at the uh, Saba University currently. And sometimes, you know, I'm, you said you are a member of the Christian Democratic Party and that reminded me uh, of the general problem that we still face in Germany and maybe all over Western Europe. That I ask myself, you know, on the one hand, we claim that we are secularized societies, states, at least as, as long as you are talking about what you call the public, the law that are governing our so social life. But of course we have to admit that there are also other laws or other regulations which relate to religion. But I'm um, definitely not going to tell you uh, for, uh, or, or, um, of which church I'm a member, but because I think it shouldn't matter. You know, I'm a member of a church, but it's my private thing and not a public thing. And uh, so I also ask everybody what he or she thinks about the borderline between the public sphere and the religious spheres, you know? I have nothing against any kind of religion, religion and I always argue in favor of tolerance as long as nobody wants to tell me what I have to do because of religion, yeah? other people's religion or my own religion. Yeah? That's my decision, that's his or her decision, that's a private game. But as soon as I'm told what I have to do because the other is a Jew or a Muslim or a Christ or whatsoever, a Christian of whatever kind, I become allergic, I must say. Uh, so this is also where the trouble uh, really starts, uh, I guess, where religion is not an answer to the problems we are facing in our human life, but where the religion is part of the problem. And uh, this is also something we should discuss. I don't like Christian states, I don't know, I don't like Islamic states, I don't know, I don't like any kind of religious states, but secular states. And this is of course the trouble we are in in Western society still, and in other so-called non-Western societies even more so still today. So this is, in a way, the question of what's public, what's private, and where does a religious part come in? Thank you, thank you Ingo. And the final word goes mm -hmm. to Dr. Langsfeld. Yeah, thank you. Uh, maybe I take the, the last comment, I guess it was more uh, uh, first. Uh, I think we are in a sort of agreement. Uh, um, uh, I, I also think that religion is, uh, is a private uh, um, uh, private thing. Um, I'm a member of the uh, uh, so-called Christian Democratic Party. Yes, you pointed it out correctly, but I put on the slide conservative for a good reason, actually, because I, uh, I'm not 
one of uh, uh, one of the CDU members who is now currently saying, uh, "Oh, my Christian worldview uh, drives me to do this and that," uh, because I agree with you. It's uh, it's uh, it's in the end, it's uh, uh, it's it's private, but. Uh, we are faced with the challenges, and I presented three topics to you, and all of them are in the public space, in schools, more or less, but also, as I, as I told you, hospitals and the police. And I think this is a challenge of an open, tolerant society. Um, uh, same challenge as in my party. Uh, we, we, have, we want to attract uh, uh, people from the Muslim community, for instance, but there is this... Uh, this, this threshold or this, this reluctance because we are called Christians by some of them, not by all, but uh, it is very noticeable that they, uh, easier, they were much easier in approaching uh, uh, the SPD or, or the Green Party, although most of them, or a considerable uh, portion of them, are much more conservative than those uh, left-wing parties, at least from my point of view. Uh, we have done not such a great job until now, but we... Um, um, and we are working in that direction, but the name is, of course, a little bit of, uh, of a challenge there. But um, if you look into our program and into, into our set of rules, um, we, uh, we are not defying, defining ourselves as a religious party. Uh, we are defining ourselves as a modern democratic party, which involves Christian other faces and also people who, have, uh, um, uh, who, are, not, uh, who are not religious. Um, the first question, I would fully agree. I think uh, I w I'm not proposing new laws. Actually, I'm very reluctant. Uh, I, uh, uh, but I'm a fan of clear rules. Rules in schools, school uh, rules in, in hospitals, rules vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the police. And uh, those probably need to be put in, into law, I guess, uh, to make them more forceful. But in general, we should try to find solutions without applying the force of law. I would certainly agree, but, um, but we have to have this discussion. And if in the end we need a law, because otherwise uh, people will not uh, follow it, then, then this, this is like the, the ultima, uh, ultima ratio in, in such a discussion. The second question, as I understood it, uh, points to a very general problem, and I think this is also intermingled with the third uh, uh, question comment. Um, we have a strong bias in our current migration into Germany. Um, it is too much relying on this asylum refugee thing and uh, much less on, uh, on opening paths for illegal uh, migration into Germany um, because people want to live here. Because this is obviously something not completely different, but uh, with, uh, in a different aspect. Um, we are currently mainly letting people in via the asylum refugee uh, um, option, and that's a bad thing, I think. It's, it's important for those who really are in need of shelter, but as I told you, this is only a portion of, of, of the people who are actually uh, uh, coming, and it's certainly only a portion of those who want to come to Germany, um, as you rightly pointed out. And a lot of the issues you, you've correctly identified are have a root cause in exactly this, um, uh, this uh, topic, because um, we are not letting people in based on how many uh, houses we have and how much work we have, how much uh, skills we need, and how much option we present uh, to, to the migrants. Um, but we are currently mainly um, giving them uh, the right to, uh, to live in Germany on the assumption often correct, but not always, that they have no other option. And uh, they need to be uh, uh, sheltered on humanitarian grounds. And this is a strong bias. This is a huge challenge we have. And it's a strong political discussion uh, on how we solve this problem. Uh, one solution would be an immigration law. Uh, and I am also tend to be in favor of this. but. You also have to understand that with this open, very liberal asylum policy, um, this creates huge tension within the German society because a lot of people would say, why would we allow even more people to come in when we are already so generous? Um, and we can't even house uh, and give work to those 
um, who are really in need. So uh, this is a, a huge topic, but uh, but I think uh, we one we have to uh, we have to address uh, in earnesty um, because uh, you see the issues with people not having proper work um, prospects, not having proper housing in uh, in Germany and and so forth. Um, that is certainly not not a situation uh, which which helps anybody. So yes. I, I, I fully agree that this is an issue, but it's not easily solved. So thank you, I would say. Yeah. All right. Yeah? If we take students on excursions or if we set up intercultural communication conferences, it's not only about to give people a chance to have first-hand information, but to inspire them and to ask more questions than they actually take home as answers. I think in that respect, you did an excellent job. There's a lot of food for thought that we can all work on, both in the conference as well as in the framework of our program. Before we continue with Dr. Mulak, I do not only want to thank you, but also apologize for stealing half of the group because we have another appointment at the chancellery and only stopped by because we didn't want to miss the opportunity to come here. Thank you very much for your presentation as well as your ability to answer the questions and please join me for a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you again very much for uh, from my side as well Dr. Langsfeld it was an honor to have you here.